Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Burlau from the great state of Idaho. I'm uh, a support group leader with the Southern Idaho Scleroderma Support Group. I am also a counselor with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, as of the last couple of years, I have become a caregiver for my wife who uh, was diagnosed with scleroderma two years ago. Um, outside of my uh, work with the VA, I am also a disability advocate. I've been involved with uh, disability advocacy for about 15 years. Um, I'm actively involved with the State Rehabilitation Council and the State Independent Living Council. So I give a lot of presentations in the local community and also across the country about living with a disability or providing services to people with disabilities. And one of the presentations I do quite a bit is called A Day in the Life of a Person with a Disability. Today we're talking about compassion fatigue, but I'm going to kind of integrate the two topics. So I'm going to give you kind of a visual example of what it's like to live with a disability. And many of you already know what it's like to live with a disability because some of you are either diagnosed with or your caregivers of people with scleroderma. And a lot of the issues experienced by people with scleroderma carry over to their caregivers. So um, not to put anyone on the spot, but is there a volunteer I can get? Jenny, maybe? Could you come up and? I'm not, actually, I'm not putting her on the spot. I talked to her a little bit last night. But we're going to do a little activity here. And I want to get the audience involved. And it's going to be a day in the life of a person with a disability. So. Please have a seat. So this is where I get all of you involved, because trust me, if you had to hear me talk for the next hour, you'd either be running out the door or falling asleep. So when we talk about a day in the life of a person with a disability, specifically scleroderma, can any of you tell me what is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Try to get out of bed. Try to get out of bed, exactly, exactly. You know, I think the ordinary person would say, well, I hop out of bed. For a lot of people with a disability, whether it be scleroderma or any disability, you're trying to get out of bed. Sometimes you don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes you're rolling out of bed. Sometimes you're crawling out of bed. Sometimes you have to use what's called a bed cane to get out of bed. So what most people would say, hopping out of bed, you're just trying to get out of bed. What's the next thing you do after you get out of bed? Take medication. Everyone has medications they have to take. And this is a small sample size. I know with my wife, she has about 30 different pills she takes every morning. She takes pills at night. She has to separate the pills. It can be literally exhausting, as I'm sure most of you know, trying to count your pills, making sure you're taking the right pill, not to mention issues with the pharmacy, with the insurance company. I mean, talk about fatigue. The medication alone can cause fatigue. Can you hold that for me, please? After you take your pills, what do you do next? Maybe get a cup of coffee? OK. One thing I've learned about scleroderma patients is they can't always go up and grab a normal cup of coffee. A lot of times, they have issues with holding cups. OK. They can't use a traditional cup. They can't grab things. So a lot of times, they have to have a special cup. So you can't always go to Starbucks and, and grab your favorite coffee. You have to really plan ahead for things. And again, planning ahead for everything you do can cause fatigue. I got a Starbucks cup out of the room. But if you have issues with grip, you can't always use the Starbucks cup. You might need a specially adapted cup. So hold that, please. What else do you do? Do you have to go to the bathroom, maybe? Yeah. yeah. When you get to be at my age, it's not just getting out of bed when you go to the bathroom. It's several times a night. But when you're getting up to go to the bathroom, it's not like you can hop out of bed again. You're crawling out of bed. You're rolling out of bed. Maybe you need your caregiver for assistance. Getting on and off the toilet can be a challenge. You know, you, it, it can be exhausting just going to the bathroom. I talked to a lady a couple months ago when I was at a support group leaders meeting, and she said the first year she was diagnosed with scleroderma, she didn't even want to walk. I mean, she would have rather have wet the bed than getting up. That's how it was for her. So I don't think a lot of people realize the challenges when you're going to the bathroom. So 
There you go. That's just for you. It's never been used, by the way. I wouldn't do that to her, so. But again, it's a visual example of a day in the life of a person with a disability. There's challenges going to the bathroom. You're taking pills. Just to plan something as simple as a cup of coffee, it may be hard to grip that cup of coffee. How many of you ladies put on makeup or do your hair or like to look pretty? I know my wife looks pretty every day and it can be a challenge. I hear about it, trust me. So, there you go. And again, if you're gonna use a hair dryer and you have issues gripping, you may have to get specially adapted hair dryers, curling irons, brushes, toothbrushes, doing your makeup. All of these can be challenging. And again, it contributes to fatigue, not just for the scleroderma patient, but if you're a caregiver, you're assisting with those things. You're the sounding board. You're taking on a lot. So I don't think people understand what's involved in the day of the life of a person with a disability. And the reason I like to give this visual example is it really helps people understand, okay? And if you can get comfortable talking about what it's like to not only have scleroderma, but what it's like to be a caregiver, it's a lot better off. I mean, you're gonna be able to explain it to people, and if you don't know how to explain it to people, you tell them a typical day. You know, when I get up in the morning, I don't just roll out of bed. I don't just grab a cup of coffee. I can't just turn up the heater or turn down the air conditioner. You know, you may have environmental controls. There's a lot of issues involved with living with a disability. And it's something that we should feel comfortable talking to people about, but just tell them about a day. I mean, they can relate to their day. And if they see how challenging it is to do for granted, it'll help them to understand a day in the life of a person with a disability. Everyone has to iron, take care of clothing. Um, if you have a disability, there's gonna be challenges there. I'm already having challenges. I'm about to pull the bag over there. Hold that, please. Normally, I have a big bag full of props here. For one, TSA wouldn't let me get it through, too. I don't want to overwhelm her, so. What else, have I forgotten anything? Bathing. Bathing, Bathing can be a challenge. Any hygiene can be a challenge when you live with a disability. I mean, getting in and out of the bathtub, standing for long periods of time. I know my wife has issues standing, getting in and out of the tub. And if you're a caregiver, it's not just the person with the disability, but you gotta learn how to help them. You have to learn how to be patient with them. And again, they're fatigued, you're fatigued. It's like you're both living a day in the life of a person with a disability. So I'm sorry to mess up your hair, it looks so nice. There you go. After you bathe, you gotta get ready for work. I have a friend who has no arms, okay? But somehow he's learned how to put on a necktie with no arms. He has this neat little device on his wall. It's kind of like a hook. And he puts his pants on with it, he puts a necktie on with it, he puts a shirt on with it, he lives with no arms. But again, he's learned how to overcome it, and I always tell him, you know, you're a natural problem solver. And that really is one of the gifts of living with a disability, is you learn how to be a problem solver. You learn how to do things the not so easy way. So, trust me, if my friend John can put on a necktie, we'll just put it on like that, there you go, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't wanna rip your glasses off. How many of you have issues grocery shopping, okay? I don't have a chronic medical issue, but I'll be honest with you, I have issues grocery shopping, trying to reach up to some of the things up on the counter, okay? If you're in a chair trying to navigate through some of the aisles, and you know, the ADA says that everything should be accessible, everything's not accessible. We were in Chicago a couple weeks ago, had a great time in Chicago, but it's an old city, okay? They've done a great job at preserving some of the historical aspects of the city, but 
For people who are in chairs, people who use walkers, there can be challenges. Same thing with shopping. You know, when uh, grocery stores set up their products, they don't always keep people with disabilities in mind, okay? If the product you need is on a shelf that you can't reach, you either gotta figure out a way to get it or wait on assistance from a clerk who may not, may not always be patient and understanding. So again, this is a day in the life of a person with a disability, okay? Um, learn how to explain this to people. Learn how to be your own best advocate, okay? Have humility. People respect humility. You know, it's, it's okay to tell people you need help, whether you're the person with the disability or the caregiver. And we're gonna talk a lot more about self-care and asking for help, but I just kinda of wanna give a visual representation of a day in the life of a person with a disability. So, I don't know if any of you have kids. Um, I've got three of them around here somewhere. I see one right there. But in our house, and I think you could probably relate to this, sometimes there's conflict. I bought mom a whistle because, uh, you know, when you have scleroderma and you're having issues with your lungs, you don't always want to have to raise your voice. Sometimes it hurts to talk. So something as simple as a whistle, you know, helps you out in the day of the life of a person with scleroderma. Uh, you didn't know what you were getting yourself into, did you? Cooking. Cooking can be a challenge if you have issues with grip or if you have a visual impairment. Um, I was at the Idaho Blind Commission about a month ago, and I highly recommend in your state, go to the Blind Commission for a tour sometime, okay? Because they, th they put me through an exercise, kind of like this one. They blindfolded me. They had me cook a grilled cheese sandwich. They, went, they put me in their wood shop. They had me build something. I actually burnt my hand cooking a grilled cheese sandwich, but I was blindfolded. So again, if you're living with a disability, there's going to be challenges. People need to understand that. You want to be Swede? My nickname for my wife is Swede. I'm sorry. I had to share that with everyone. So if you see Dee Burlau walking around, no, her husband calls her Swede. It's for Sweet D. Um, little pet name. There you go. Everyone has to get around. Transportation is a huge issue for people with disabilities, okay? In fact, in all the research we do, all the work I do with people with disabilities, transportation is always the biggest issue, okay? Um, a lot of people can't drive, a lot of people can drive, but driving can be a major issue, all right? Public transportation is an issue, just trying to get to doctor's appointments can be an issue, it can contribute to the fatigue we're gonna talk about, okay? Trying to learn the best schedule, uh, calling a cab, having to ask a friend or a family member. These are all issues that contribute to fatigue, okay? If you're a caregiver, you're not only a caregiver, but you have to give rides. You have to be there for the person. Again, you're gonna take on a lot of the issues that the person with scleroderma takes on. Um, Here's my little prop for cooking. I'm not gonna pile too much on her, okay? I think everyone gets the point. Uh, living with a disability, whether it be scleroderma or any disability that creates chronic pain is gonna cause fatigue. And as caregivers, that's gonna be a major issue for you as well, okay? Um, one thing we're starting to do a lot of work with at the VA is caregiver support. Um, in 2009, we developed a comprehensive caregiver support program. We recognize that a lot of the, not only the aging veterans, but a lot of the younger veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan needed a caregiver. And um, a lot of the counselors and social workers like myself were starting to recognize that uh, the caregivers were starting to experience a lot of the same issues that the veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder we're experiencing. I know when I was a kid, my dad, was a, my dad is a Vietnam veteran, and the way we lived was probably a little bit different than the way the typical household lived, okay? Uh, my dad has some issues from combat. Um, 
you know, he is real hypervigilant. Um, he happens to keep a lot of guns on hand. He's not real trusting, has a lot of issues with anxiety, okay? Anytime a person with any health issue has issues, it's going to carry over to their family, okay? So just recognize that the health, health issues of the patient is going to affect the caregivers, okay? Whether you call it compassion fatigue, secondary stress disorder, it's going to have a major impact on family and caregivers. So just recognize that. It's important to know that. It's important to know what the warning signs are. So, and that's what we're really here to talk about today is compassion fatigue. I want everyone to learn what the definition of compassion fatigue is, okay? Uh, that's part of this presentation is understanding the definition. Um, understand the seriousness of it. Are you sweating to death right there? You can shred all that off if you want. I'm, I'm not gonna use my very cooperative volunteer here, but I just wanted to make a point um, you could just throw all that off. Okay. She can throw it off, but you know, unfortunately, if you're living with scleroderma, you can't throw it off. Jake, help her out, please. So we're gonna talk about the warning signs of compassion fatigue, and most importantly, we're gonna talk about self-care, okay? I don't think I can do a better job than Andrew did last night, I'll tell you what. I mean, I was so impressed with that keynote speech that both my wife and I went up and talked to him, and. I thought, you know what, when I get up today, maybe I should just say whatever Andrew said, ditto. Because um, there is hope, okay? Everyone has hope. Everyone can have hope, I should say. Uh, but it comes through self-care. It comes through support. Um, I hope everyone in here is involved with the scleroderma support group. If you're not, I encourage it. If the person you're caring for is in a support group, I encourage you to go to the support group with them. Get involved. I talked a little bit already about the definition of compassion fatigue. And see this picture right here? That's the female version of me. OK, I'll be honest with you. I'm at work all day counseling veterans. And I work with a lot of young veterans. Not only do they have issues with military-related disabilities, but they're at that age where they seem to be involved in a lot of drama. OK? whether it's relationship issues, roommate issues, they've got a lot going on. And you know, I spend a lot of my days helping them problem solve, doing workshops with them, doing groups with them. By the end of the day, I get off work and I'm spent. I'll be honest with you, okay, I'm spent. And we have this routine around my house where I call home, and I shouldn't do this, but I do, but I think it's a husband thing. What's for dinner? Let me give you some advice right now. That's not the best way to start things out. Because I walk through the door, and, and I'll be honest with you, just because I'm up here and I have this knowledge and I'm talking about this doesn't mean I'm the best example, OK? I fail just as much as I succeed when it comes to self-care and when it comes to walking the talk. I mean, I talk the talk a lot. I'm a counselor. Um, I love my family. I'm dedicated to my family. Reality is I fail just as much as I succeed. So back to the story. I'll walk home, walk in the door, and I've been dealing with issues all day. And then I'm a caregiver for a wonderful woman with scleroderma. But as you all know, when you have scleroderma or any medical issue, it affects you. It affects you physically. It affects you emotionally. And it affects everyone around you, OK? That's reality. You know, it's not right or wrong, it's just reality of living with a chronic illness. So again, when you see that picture, think of me. A lot of you are probably saying, yep, that's me, I get it. That's the life of a caregiver. But you know what? I appreciate everything all of you do. Being a caregiver is an important job, okay? It is something to be proud of. It is something to take pride in. Compassion to fatigue is a serious issue, okay? Um, that's why at the VA, we're doing a lot of research. We're taking steps to develop caregiver support programs. Um, and it's not just a VA thing. It's becoming a major issue worldwide. I mean, 
as the baby boomer generation ages, it's not just going to be people with chronic illnesses that are going to need care, caregivers. It's going to be family members. Okay? So I think we all need to understand the importance of being a caregiver, taking pride in being a caregiver, and learning about the effects of being a caregiver. Chronic fatigue is a major issue. It can lead to burnout. Okay? Has anyone ever felt burnt out to where you just, you can't do anymore, you're spent, you're exhausted? Okay? I'm sure all of you have felt that, you know. You can't look at one other doctor. You can't get one other bill. You can't talk to one more insurance agency. Or you have a medication that you've called in. The doctor wrote the prescription, but the pharmacy says, well, we need a prior authorization. That's the daily life of a caregiver and a person with a chronic illness. So it can lead to burnout. So be aware of that. Depression. Not only is depression a chronic issue with people with disabilities, but it's a serious issue of caregivers. Okay? When, you're, when your life revolves around suffering and illness, it's going to bring you down. Okay? I don't care who you are, it's going to bring you down. I work with a lot of veterans who try to put on this attitude that my issues aren't affecting me. Okay? If those issues aren't affecting people, I'm really worried about them. Because as far as I'm concerned, depression and anxiety is a normal response to chronic illness. So understand that. Depression and anxiety is a normal response to chronic illness. Since it's normal, you need to get help. You need to get counseling. You need to be involved in a support group. You need to tell the person you're caring for I'm feeling depressed, I'm anxious, I'm scared, I'm worried about you, okay? That's, that's something to talk about. You know, it's something not to be afraid to talk about. So, disassociation. Have you ever felt like you've lost your identity, okay? You no longer identify as the person you used to identify with. Now you identify with your disability, with your illness, with your role as a caregiver. And I'm not talking to where you just feel, I'm talking you no longer feel like the person you used to be. Okay. That's compassion fatigue. Okay. It can lead to that. So understand, if you're losing who you are, you need to take care of yourself. You need to get help. Compromised immune system. This is a major issue, okay? Stress, anxiety, worry, not eating right, it can compromise your immune system. I'm sure as caregivers, you've experienced more frequent colds. You don't have the strength you used to have. You're tired, fatigued. Um, it can lead to a lot of health issues. It can lead to heart issues, okay? Um, if you can't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of the person you're caring for. So understand, compassion fatigue is a serious, serious issue. I've got some numbers here, and um, there's not a lot of quantitative research that I've been able to find on compassion fatigue. These numbers are specific to providers, so it's not really relevant to the caregiver, but in a sense it is, and let me explain in a minute. 90% uh, of new doctors report issues with compassion fatigue. Okay, and you can see all the numbers. They're all 70% and higher. Social workers, counselors, nurses, hospice workers, okay, all reporting high levels of compassion fatigue. And those are professionals, okay? Those are people that have studied about medical issues. They've kind of prepared themselves for these issues. A lot of times, they're not emotionally involved with the people they're caring for, but they're experiencing high rates of compassion fatigue. So if people who aren't emotionally connected and who have prepared themselves to deal with the illness if they have rates of compassion fatigue that are that high, imagine 
how high it is for the family caregiver, okay? I can tell you it's a lot higher. I can tell you as a family caregiver, I'm emotional all the time. I'm anxious all the time. I worry about my wife all the time. Every time the phone rings at work, I panic, okay? Every time I'm on my way home, I wonder how things are gonna be, you know? If she's gonna have issues breathing, if she's gonna have leg pain, um, if we're gonna have to go to the doctor, if we're gonna have to put homework on hold for the kids and go to the doctor. You know, we kind of plan around health issues, but we're not alone. I know everyone in this room does the same thing, okay? So my guess is most of you have experienced some level of compassion fatigue, okay? You may, have, you may not have thought of it that way, but trust me, I would bet everyone in this room at one time or another has experienced compassion fatigue. Some warning signs, some questions to ask yourself. And again, this presentation was kind of developed for clinicians, but it's relevant to caregivers. Um, it says, do I drag myself to work or avoid clients? Okay, you gotta ask yourself, have you ever tried to avoid the person with scleroderma? Okay, there's no shame in it. I have, okay? It's not that I don't love my wife, but I'm exhausted. There's times when, especially during football season, I wanna watch the game. You know what, I wanna, I wanna do this. I'm tired, I've worked all day. Like I said in the beginning, I have failed just as much as I've succeeded, okay? But I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my family, and I believe taking care of people is very important. I've always been a caregiver, I'll always be a caregiver, whether it's my wife or someone else. I take care of people, that's what I do. But you have to ask yourself, do you ever just drag yourself out of bed or try to avoid the person? So if you have, that's a warning sign. Do I miss appointments or miss work altogether? If you're a family caregiver, it's hard to miss taking care of that person because you're with them all the time. Even if you're working during the day, Trust me, your work life still involves calling to check in with that person, okay? Not a day goes by that I don't call my wife right about 9.30 in the morning. Same thing, how are things going? How are you doing? And she always says, I don't need a babysitter. Well, I know, I know. But for me, I do it, okay? For my peace of mind. She's a grown woman, she's very capable, uh, but for my peace of mind, I need to make sure she's okay. Um, do you make personal judgments? This says toward clients, but do you make personal judgments toward the person you're caring for? A lot of people are guilty of that. You know what? We get tired, we get exhausted, we get frustrated, okay? Um, it's okay. If you've made personal judgments, if you've minimized their issues or been frustrated with their issues, that's a warning sign. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's a warning sign about compassion fatigue. Do I ever behave unprofessionally? That's kind of the same as the last one. That's more geared toward the clinician. Um, and I'm sure everyone in this room has had a medical provider or a clinician behave unprofessionally, okay? They're human beings too. Um, you know, we should always act professional toward the people we work with, toward the people we serve. But I'll tell you what, uh, we've experienced a lot of people in the healthcare field that, in my opinion, have been unprofessional. I got to step back and think, okay, you know, they're dealing with a lot of patients. We're not their only patient, but it's hard. It's hard. They may be experiencing compassion fatigue. So. Have I drank, used drugs, or ever eaten to relieve stress? That's a big issue for my clients, drinking, okay? A lot of the veterans I work with have issues with sleep, okay? They're not scleroderma patients. I don't have any scleroderma patients I work with, but a lot of the veterans I work with have issues with sleep, so a lot of them drink. Chronic alcoholism is a major problem for the veterans I work with, but it's also a major problem for caregivers. Okay, you know, to, to relieve stress, people drink. Um, 
to calm their nerves, people do drugs. Um, I'm guilty of finding comfort in food, okay? I like a nice, big, juicy steak. That's, if I'm stressed out, give me some red meat, and my other vice is Diet Coke. But um, I find comfort in that. I don't gorge myself, but to relieve stress, I like to have a nice, juicy steak. So if that's a warning sign of compassion fatigue, I'll, I'll take that one, but I'll take the steak. Um, do I take my work home with me? If you're a caregiver, you're home already, okay? Or if you're caring for someone close to you, that's pretty close to home. So I would say as a family caregiver, um, you really can't get away from your work. It's who you are. It's part of your life. Um, but it's a warning sign if you're letting it affect you, okay? And it's hard not to let it affect you. You care about your family member. You care about the person you're caring for, whether it's a family member, a friend, or if you're just a paid caregiver, you care about those people, uh, and it's gonna affect you. Anyone ever seen these type of ladies driving around, doing their makeup, drinking a cup of coffee, talking on their cell phones, texting? I've been guilty of texting when driving. It is a path of destruction, okay? And when we're serving as caregivers or when we're suffering with a chronic illness, we literally are on a path of destruction. You're doing a lot. You're taking care of a person, very important. You're taking care of yourself, or you should be, very important. Um, you know, you have other obligations, children, work. You've got a lot going on. and. If you don't prioritize things, and if you don't try not to take on too much, you really are heading down a path of destruction. So um, you need help, okay? That's why we're here today. That's why we get involved in support groups. That's why we get counseling. That's why we get engaged in self-care. So self-care is very important. Again, I've failed just as much as I've succeeded. I'm not the best when it comes to self-care, but I have this knowledge. And since I have this knowledge, I want to share it with you, okay? Um, you need to develop skills to take care of yourself. You need to develop skills to help your loved one or the person you're caring for take care of themselves. Again, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of the other person, okay? And if you're a natural caretaker like me, it's gonna catch up to you, okay? And I know everyone in this room wouldn't be here if they weren't caretakers, caregivers, and they didn't care. So please develop self-care skills. Okay, I'm gonna go over some self-care discussion or suggestions. And during this section, I would let, I'm going to welcome suggestions, okay? Because again, what works for some may not work for others. What works in Boise, Idaho may not work in Florida or New York or Boston or wherever you're from. But um, self-care is very important. Uh, you need to engage in things that bring you joy, okay? Outside of your caregiver role, okay? It's important to remember what you used to be involved with. I mean, if you had a hobby, re-engage in that or stay engaged in that. If you were interested in sports or music or whatever it is that makes you happy, you need to stay engaged in that. Find a specific time every day where you can engage in these kind of activities. Okay. Um, it says avoid taking on new clients. Well, that's not real relevant to this group. At least I hope not. I hope you don't have more scleroderma patients that you have to take on. If it's part of your support group, that's great, but we're talking about self-care and taking care of yourself. Learn to say no. That's my biggest weakness. I'll tell you right now, I have a hard time saying no, okay? When my wife with those pretty blue eyes looks at me and asks me for something, I have a hard time saying no. When anyone asks me, I like to be the go-to guy. 
I have a hard time saying no. And I think that's a natural thing for caregivers, okay? You all have it in you, you're all caretakers, that's your personality. My guess is you all have a hard time saying no, but you need to learn to say no. You need to learn to set boundaries, okay? And that's hard to do, you know? If you're helping someone out who's suffering and they need your help, but you're spent, you're exhausted, you gotta set boundaries, okay? You know, learn how to communicate with that person. Learn how to tell them, you know what? I love you, I wanna help you, but I need to take care of myself a little bit too, okay? Maybe you might wanna find, find a backup caregiver, okay? Um, I know at the VA, we have a caregiver training program. Um, we have backup caregivers that we provide for the veterans that are in the caregiver program. I know um, if you're getting Medicaid or Medicare benefits, there's respite care. Um, you know, don't just say no and abandon them. Learn how to say no, but have a resource for them, okay? But it's important to learn how to say no. Receive counseling, very important. Whether it's going to a therapist, talking to a friend who just happens to have good counseling skills, uh, talking to a member of the clergy, just talking to someone. You know, it's important to talk about what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, as long as you talk to an objective person, you know. Um, get some type of counseling. If you don't have time to get professional counseling, which I understand it's hard when you're working and you're caring for someone, it's hard to find time to take care of yourself. Find some kind of outlet. Eat healthy foods. You know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out, okay? Um, I told you I like my juicy steak. I don't eat it all the time, but I try to eat healthy, okay? Um, I try to get a good breakfast. Um, my wife always tells me I don't eat healthy enough, which I probably don't, but I'm here to tell you, eat healthy, take care of yourself. Again, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of others. So engage in regular activity, preferably exercise. Okay, and I know you're all gonna say, I do activity. I take care of this person. I help them get to point A to point B. I do laundry, I do dishes, and that's activity. But do some type of exercise that gets your heart rate up, okay? That gets your mind focused on something other than caring for the person. I don't care if it's going for a hike, playing tennis, playing golf, playing basketball. Some kind of exercise is important. Keep work separate from family life. Again, that's hard to do when you're a family caregiver, but try to find something separate, okay? Something outside of the house. Um, engage in spiritual activities. Um, I was real impressed last night when Andrew talked about uh, prayer. Um, I really admire people that'll talk about that in a public forum because I believe in prayer. Um, in fact, I'll share this with this small group. Um, after that talk last night, I walked up and I talked to him. And I shared with Andrew, you know, when I was on the plane here, I prayed and I asked that someone get the message to my wife that I can't get to her, okay? Because as a spouse, you're not always the best messenger, okay? Um, you're too close to him. You know, as a parent, you're not always the best messenger to your kid. Sometimes it helps to have a good messenger. And I honestly believe my prayers were answered when I heard Andrew say a lot of the things I've said, but coming from me, I'm the husband, you know, I'm the spouse. It doesn't mean the same thing, that's reality. So again, spirituality is important. I believe in prayer, I'm glad he talked about that. Develop a self-care plan. We are planning people, we have iPads, we have computers, we have, I don't think anyone carries those little planners around anymore, but we plan everything out, but we don't plan how to take care of ourselves. I mean, you look at your calendar, and I'm sure it's filled up with all kinds of things, doctor's appointments, work appointments, kids' activities, but rarely is there anything on there for self-care. So plan that as a regular part of your day. If you can't do it daily, a few times a week, plan for self-care, okay? Whether it's spiritual, physical, emotional, plan for self-care. 
this is just something I threw together. Um, there are apps where you can plan out self-care, where you can plan just about anything. But if you're like me, the apps become so complicated, I don't use them anyway. So whatever works is what I'm saying. I don't care if it's a spreadsheet, if it's a little yellow sticky pad, um, I don't care what it is, find a way to plan out self-care, okay? And not just any kind of self-care, do a variety, okay? Physical health, go for a walk, go to the gym, you know? A lot of healthcare plans will provide memberships to gyms. Um, get involved with a group, go on a scleroderma walk. There's a lot you can do to engage in physical health. Emotional health, okay? On there, I've got do a girl's night out, a guy's night out. And I don't care if it's going to a movie, going out to dinner, hanging out at the park, playing golf. Do things to engage your emotional side, okay? Um, get involved in a support group. Um, we have the Southern Idaho Scleroderma Support Group. And um, we're fairly new. We've been around about six months. Um, we've been having guest speakers every month, which has been a good thing but I'd like to see us get more of a supportive role going. Again, we're new, but um, provide support for each other because you're taking on a lot and most people don't understand what you're going through. Most people can't relate. You know, most people go through daily life and they don't have the same worries. They're not dealing with insurance companies. They're not dealing with multiple doctor's appointments. They're not dealing with the same things, okay? But people in your support group generally are. You know, um, they can relate. They may, may be able to help out with childcare if you need childcare for something. They may be able to recommend a certain physician or maybe they know a medication that helped and you can talk to your medical provider to see if they recommend that medication. So utilize those support groups, very important. You know, the main thing is take care of yourself. Um, I'm not going to go over everything on here. These are just a few examples. One thing I'd like to ask the audience, do you have any suggestions for self-care? And I want to know best practices, what we can take back to Idaho and say, you know what, uh, this is what they're doing in Wichita. This is what they're doing in Boston. This was an idea. So I'd like you all to share with me what some of you are doing. I, I'm actually a, a holistic health coach, and a lot of what you talk about, it does. It, it's, it's all about the emotional, the spiritual, the physical. But one of the things, and this all falls around it, but it's just self-love, right? Yeah. It's all, it's cultivating self-love techniques to, you know, if, it, if it's going in and just taking a bubble bath. Or, you know, anything like that to where, you know, I, I think a lot of what you've got up there kind of falls in. But, but remembering to love yourself because you love everyone around you. You love that person that you're caring for so much that you forget to love yourself. And you become this faucet and you're just pouring yourself into it. And, and where's your faucet? You know, you have to give yourself that love and, and whatever that looks like, cultivating whatever kind of spiritual or physical or emotional practice. So. I love that you said self-love. That's, you know, when, and again, I keep going back to Andrew's speech last night because it really had an impact on me. But one thing he said that I totally agree with is everyone is in the position they're in for a reason. It's not just about the caregiver. It's not just about the person with scleroderma. Um, look at the impact you can have on other people, okay? But self-love is very important. And understanding you have value, and the value you have can benefit others. So thank you, yeah. I was gonna say, you had a slide that said, just say no. Uh, we try to establish with my bride and I a timeline, because no is a very strong negative word. Can you establish something? Is there a, I can't do it right now, is there a timeline, 30 minutes, an hour, how urgent is this need? Rather than just say no, say, well, Joey, when is it, can I do, I'm busy right now, how about 30 minutes, how about an hour? So no is a very strong negative. It is. Can you, how about not now, or how about later, or what's your timeline? I like that. Yeah, learn how to communicate that. Just saying no can alienate people. It can piss people off. I've been there, again, I've failed as much as I've succeeded. 
Um, rarely do I just say no, but I don't always communicate things the way I should. Um, I don't always hear things as good as I would like to. So communication, don't just say no, but say, again, I like the timeline thing. The book says no sometimes too. Oh yeah, I know that look, <laughs> trust me. Yes, sir. Um, taking short trips for the weekend or for a Tuesday, Wednesday, and uh, getting away, even if it's only a couple hundred miles away from home, it's something different. I think that's important, yeah. Taking a short trip. Um, you know, if you stay in the same area all the time, the same area where you go to your doctor's appointments, the same area where you're going to the pharmacy, the same area where you're on the phone dealing with the insurance company, the same area where all the stress is, you're not gonna get away from it. So that's a great suggestion. Take a short trip. You know, with you live up in the Seattle area. There's a lot of beauty around that. There's people from St. Louis. I mean, just going down the river is a good thing. We don't have a lot in Idaho, but... Uh, there is some stuff. Yeah. Well, in the beginning, um, you feel like you're doing everything for your husband to help him out. But I've learned right from the get-go that that wasn't working for me. So I've taught him to make his own smoothies. I was going to three weeks and make your own healthy meals. And I want to see the meals. So he took pictures <laughs> and sent them to me through email. Wow. But I have taught him to do a lot of things that he doesn't want to do, but he has to do them Good. to keep up his weight, to be healthier. Um, so it, it was stressful in the beginning, but I, I just say, no, I'm not going to do this. You have to help yourself. That's huge. I like that. And I bet you feel some, some pride that you were able to not only help him, but teach him to help himself. Right. So I like that. Teach the person you're caring for to care for themselves, whether it's making a smoothie, doing laundry, um, managing medication. I know a lot of the veterans I work with, um, too many of them, their caregivers do everything to include sorting their medication for them and keeping track of things. And, and that's fine if they have cognitive issues, but um, if you're relying on your caregiver so much to where you're not even capable of caring for yourself. That's a dangerous position to be in, so that's great. Yeah. Yes? Well, my wife and I was in sort of a, an argument about this. But I mean, for me, I, I, I'm a digital media. Wait a minute. You argue with your wife? She's always right. She's always right. You're a newlywed, right? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. She's always right. You got it. My Zen zone is when I'm in work and in creative ways. I'm editing videos, doing music, all that stuff, and I'm sort of in the Zen. But she argues that you're working. I'm like, no, I'm not. This is me not thinking about anything else. So we're sort of, and what do, you, what do you think about that? It's still work, but it's sort of like my own little space that I'm in, that I'm not thinking about taking care of her, I'm not thinking about, you know, other, my nine-to-five or doing stuff with the foundation. <laughs> I think you got to be careful with that. Let me tell you why. Um, I know there's an old saying, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But it's important to have something outside of work. And I know you get joy in it, and I know it is your zen place. But look for alternatives as well. And I'm not saying don't enjoy what you do, because that's great. If you have something that you do that you love and it's also work, that's awesome. But still look for other things. Um, that, that's, that's, that's my thought. Implement the timeline. What's that? I like the Implement the timeline. Yeah, I do. If yeah. you're like, just give me a couple hours on this and leave me alone. Yeah, yeah if you set boundaries. It's, it's, it's either that or hacking or creating something in the garage. You know? Hacking? Oh, I would suggest. Did you say hacking? No, <laughs> hacking is like modifying. When I hear computers and hacking, I'm like. I don't do a bunch of studio. I don't know. My wife has a story. My wife has a story. It's like, you know, adding a foot pedal to her scooter because she can't use her hands. That kind of stuff. That, that's the stuff that I do. Okay, like, okay. You know, but it's, it says not readily, readily available. But for me, it's like the planning, the design, the engineering, putting something together. For her, it looks like I'm working, but for me, I'm doing something for myself. 
And do you communicate that to her that you set those boundaries and you say, you know what? I know it seems like I'm working, yeah. but really, this is how I'm taking care of myself. Yeah, that, that's what she does to me. Okay. You know, different strokes for different folks. That's, yeah, exactly. you know, yes, ma'am. You said um, earlier, you know, take time for yourself. Well, my daughter normally doesn't get up till 11, so, and I get up early. And so that morning time is so important to me to do my things, to do what I want to do. Um, I'm all alone. It's just do it. It's, yeah. it's really important for me. So I, I really agree. You need to take even, even if it's an hour, just take your own time every day. Yeah. So what you're saying is you have a routine. Yeah. Every morning, and that's important. Yeah, and if she happens to get up early, I go, oh, Why did you get up early? <laughs> Go back to bed. Yeah. Exactly. Now I, I'm, I'm a, I like to have a routine myself. Sometimes it's a little chaotic, but I like to have a routine. Um, yeah. It's important. I find comfort in it. Um, so yeah, if you have a routine, a well-established routine, and you've set those boundaries, you know that's that's huge. So. Sorry, my biggest problem is in theory, I'll be so late out of Let me, pref let me preface my answer with, again, I've failed as much as I've succeeded, okay? And what you just described is our home life, okay? I have this knowledge, and I'm sharing it. It's hard, okay? What you just described, I think, is very common with people with scleroderma. And add on top of that another family member with a chronic health issue. Um, you just got to try, and you got to keep trying, and you got to stay committed. You got to schedule things, and just understand things aren't always going to work out. There's going to be the meltdown, you know, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong at the house. I've just come to accept that's our life, and that's not the best answer. I'm sorry. You know, networking, accept help, learn how to ask for help, and that was hard for me. Learning how to ask for help and accepting help. Um, do you have a support group? Not really. If I you live in the middle of nowhere. You're in California. Yeah. Aren't you in the San Diego area? Yeah, but we're up in North County. So oh, okay. You know, everybody's got a couple of acres. Okay. So you don't really see your yeah. Do you have family around? No. Um, that's hard. We, we don't have a lot of family either, so that's hard. You know, find a network. Um, you know, whether it's a slurderma support group, a service organization. A, a church, a nonprofit, find, find something and don't be afraid to ask for help. And it's hard to do, but it's. Uh, one thing I observed was uh, starting. Yeah. Start a school. You don't have a grandparent to start on. Find someone and have a little thing around. Can I answer her? Yes, please. everyone to do everything 
and then I have it that goes off every day at a certain time that says Larry, and it, that's me. And it's a 10 minute little time that I can just sit. Sometimes it's 4.30 in the morning because that's when I can sit myself in. And I can sit quietly, and that's really all that I need for myself is that 10 minutes to just sit quietly where no one's saying my name. I'm so sick of hearing my name. And I hate the word mom some days, and, and it depends on how the word mom is. And it's like, mom, that's great, but it's mom. It's always that, like, urgency. So, um, there are those days that I, you know, that I schedule things, like call this day, and, and I, I'm going to, how smart are you? I can tell how smart you are after talking for two minutes. Is there a supervisor I can have to do? Is there someone to go? And I'm nasty right away. I don't be nice for a I'm like, I mean, right away. I don't want to talk to you. I can tell you don't know what you're talking about. Give me the next guy up. And I get friends for fun. And I'm a nurse too, so I give me like a little more than the truth for me because I know this could be me and go to the top. Who's billing? Okay, let me talk to Dylan. And I want to, and he has my I'm back from you by Wednesday. I'm on Wednesday. And I have, I'm back from Wednesday. 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 I'm back from